we are told in Genesis 2, verses 2 and 3, that when God completed his six days of creation, that he rested from all his work. It's important to note that this is not just a statement about rest. It is also a statement about work. God establishes here that man who is created in his image is created for the purpose of serving God by means both of his work and his rest, specifically that is coming into his presence in worship. This pattern of life is established by God in the creation week. He worked six days and rested the seventh. The important thing to see here is the relationship between these two aspects. When God ended his work of creation, his rest gives an indication that the work done was good and unto God's glory. Most of you have had your pattern of life, I would say, somewhat disturbed in recent weeks. This is particularly true in the sense of both, again, work and rest. And I trust that by now most of you are able to assemble again and worship God in public worship. But you might still be working at home or perhaps working less or even have lost your job, and seeking to find some way to work. Hopefully these changes will be short-lived for most of you, or you may need to readjust in some way, but it remains important to remember that God has given us a pattern for life which deals with both work and rest. So we all seek to return to, as we seek to return to some form of normalcy or a term that we've all come to use or to hear about at, in this time is a new norm. It might be a good time to be reminded about what scripture says concerning both work and worship. Please understand that the reference to God creating and resting in Genesis 2 is not just that after six days, God found that he needed to take some time off. Of course, God never needs to take time off, and he doesn't. Rather, his rest is related to the work completed. In fact, the rest says something about the work in that it was fulfilling and a blessing. This is also a pattern, then, for Adam to follow and it remains for us today a pattern for life. Prior to sin, Adam was given a task to do which was pleasant and fulfilling. And in addition to that task, to dress and keep the garden, he met with God in the most intimate face-to-face -face way in which he came to God in fellowship. It is really important to understand that the pattern is not only one in which every seventh day we should remember to worship God. Rather, what we do on the other six days is equally part of the pattern for life given to us who are created in God's image as a work of service unto him. Now, in the New Testament, the accomplished work of Christ following Christ's accomplished work, we begin the week by meeting with God. We do so in the most intimate, face-to-face -face worship with God. And having worshiped with him, we are prepared then to serve him in our labor. And so part of that work is to struggle with the sin that is within ourselves and the sin that is in the world around us. I really like what the Heidelberg Catechism says here when it addresses this issue in commenting on the fourth commandment when we read in question and answer number 103 that all the days of my life I rest from my evil works. This is a struggle. It is a fight against the devil. 
the world, and even our own sinful flesh. The Apostle Paul speaks of it as a wrestling match in Ephesians 6. So as we are engaged in this spiritual struggle, seeking to work for the kingdom of Christ, we get tired. The manner in which we get tired is not simply physical, but also spiritual. We, in fact, look for spiritual strength. Thus, we look with anticipation to the Lord's day by which we are renewed spiritually by means of a face-to-face -face meeting with God in worship. Being fed spiritually, we are then ready to take up the struggle once again in our work. You begin to see a pattern of life in which your relationship with God prepares you to serve God in your vocation, your life of labor. The work that you do unto the advancement of the kingdom of Christ leads you to seek spiritual rejuvenation from God. This pattern also leads us to understand that our work is in fact worth something. Work is pleasing unto God and is to be seen as service unto him. And this connection we can learn again from this Reformed Confession, the Heidelberg Catechism, as it comments on the Eighth Commandment. We find in question and answer number 111 that the purpose for labor is not only to provide for ourselves and our families, but also has a purpose regarding those who truly are the poor. By your faithful labor, God has provided for a means by which the needs of the poor can be met. You know, there's been a great influence in Christianity uh, to basically segregate life. And what I mean by that is that often life is seen that one part of life has to do with our spiritual aspect, our worship, and perhaps on a daily basis we spend time with God in reading scripture and prayer, etc. Uh, but those are all the things that are put into one category called spiritual. Then on the other hand, we have all of the rest of life, and it's somehow seen as being basically neutral. In reality, the reference here in Genesis 2, reflecting upon God's work and rest, shows that the totality of life is, again, to be lived before God the Creator in service. With the recreating work of Christ, we are again able, at least in a beginning way, to serve God in work and rest by means of this pattern. You know, the really neat implication about this is that worship gives meaning and purpose to work. And on the other hand, work enhances the meaning and purpose of worship. My encouragement to you would be that when you understand that your work, your vocation, is not just for the sake of work, rather a service unto God, then your worship will be more meaningful. And the more that you understand your worship is meaningful as an intimate face-to-face -face meeting with God, the more your work will be fulfilling and satisfying. Thank you for listening. Be safe and God bless.